I can remember back when I was in college, and any person that I came across who heard or found out what I was studying in school, they respond with one of three ways. Ladies would say, hey, James. I'm like, what's up, Ma? She's like, hey, so what you say you studying again? Uh, you know, I'm elementary ed. I want to teach. And then she'd be like, oh, uh, uh, these kids nowadays is too bad. I'll be them caught a case, but they'll love you, though. I right, appreciate it. My dudes would be like, ho, what up, though? I'm like, ah, out here trying to get it. What's up? They're like, yo, what you say you studying again? I'm like, yo, I'm elementary ed, man. I want to teach. And they'd be like, oh, so, so you're not trying to make no money, huh? That's, that's what you're trying to tell me. <laughs> and then after that, I have to hit them with the official education major response. Be like, no, I'm not trying to make money. I'm trying to make a difference. You got to say it real dramatic, just like that. <laughs> but the response... The response that stuck out to me the most is what I would receive from my professors when they would see me or any of my call me Mr. Brothers in their class. They'd be like, you guys are going to be awesome educators. It's going to be so easy for you. I, I can't wait to see you in the classroom. And I was like, yo, why? What, what makes you say that? They're like, yo, if you teach in those Title I schools like you say you are, those kids are absolutely going to love you. I mean, think about it. How valuable will it be for a young person to see someone that looks like them, that they can relate to, that relates to them, that's value in education? It can truly change their life. And I was like, yo, you, you got a point. Because for many, it's almost impossible for them to be something that they cannot see. So I was extremely excited about the opportunity that I had. So let's fast forward a few years. It's my first year teaching. It's fifth grade, it's Legacy Charter in Greenville, South Carolina, and I prepared like many other first year teachers prepared. I, I watched a lot of movies, I did. I watched a whole bunch of movies to prepare, but it was the good movies, yo. I watched Freedom Riders. I was like, yo, that little line game, that tape game, I'm playing that game. I, I put it in the plans, it's happening, like, it's just gonna work. Then I, I had to watch the Ron Clark story. I said, wait a minute, you mean to tell me that double dutching and home visits is the recipe? Yes, I'm baking that up. I'm making it happen. But then I had to watch the OG Mr. Clark. I watched Lean On Me. I was like, yo, I'm going to find Sam, and I'm going to help everybody take the chains off the doors. I'm ready. It's about to happen. I was extremely excited. I said, it's going to be easy. But like I said, it's... Fifth grade, it's my first year teaching Legacy Charter in Greenville, South Carolina, but I might as well have been in Fayetteville, North Carolina, because somebody should have told me it would be like this. Listen, all I was listening to and hearing were my professor saying how easy it would be because those kids would relate to me, but as I truly begin to listen, I begin to hear things like, Mr. Ho, what's up? You remind me of my big brother. I was like, oh, he must be swaggy then, nah. <laughs> okay, so. You see, my big brother, he's locked up. He's no longer around. So, Mr. Ho, when I see you, I see him. And when I see him, I feel that abandonment. I'm like, mm, I hear you. Or the infamous, Mr. Ho, you look just like my daddy. No, I don't look like your daddy. Yes, you do. My mama saying too. I bet she do. I feel he got, he got long dreads just like you. He be laughing, telling jokes just like you. He just, he, he just way taller than you. I figured, I figured that. So I remind you of your father. That has to be a good thing, right? He's like, father, I wouldn't call him all that. You mean the man that says he's coming to get me every weekend but never shows up? Or you mean the man that says, yo, I'm going to be at your game on Tuesday, but... I guess it's still Monday, Mr. Ho. Or the man that used to live in the house with my mom and me, but now he lives across town with some other lady, and now I'm trying to figure out why he don't love me. You see, when I see you, I see him. And when I see him, I see something I don't rock when you see my professors were correct. Those young people did relate to me, but what they related was something that they resented. And so there I was, stuck trying to figure out how do I get these young people to shift from where they are to where they need to be, but where were they exactly? I mean, what exactly is resentment? You see, resentment has been defined as bitter indignation as the result of being treated unfairly. When a person has bitterness, anger within them because they feel like someone or something was unfair. Once I recognized that, I was like, wait a minute. This has absolutely nothing to do with me. 
You see, first thing you had to recognize is that resentment is not always personal. Meaning, just because someone is showing signs of resentment towards you, it does not mean that you're the person that treated them unfairly. I knew full well that I didn't treat my students unfairly, but yet still I reminded them of someone or something that did. And once I was able to step back and not take it personally, then I was able to think critically and clearly about a solution. So now I'm still back at square one. How do I get my young people to shift from resentment to respect? But before I can get to that, I had to ask an even bigger question. I had to answer why. Why did I want them to shift in the first place? Full transparency for a second. Initially, all I wanted was for my students to like me. I wanted them to say how much they love Mr. Hogue's class. But yo, if the reason why I want someone to shift is for me and not them, then I missed it. Because if a person is walking around holding on to resentment, that means that they're holding on to anger. They're holding on to bitterness. And if you're holding on to that, then it's impossible for you to grow. As an educator, my job was to make sure I can prepare my young people for the future. But it's impossible for you to walk into your future if you're holding on to hurt from your past. First things first, resentment is not always personal. Secondly, you have to recognize the reason why I wanted to shift has to be for that person, not for me. Now I had to figure out where I wanted them to go. Where did I want them to shift from? Like I said before, initially I wanted them just to like me, but I realized if I really wanted to see them grow, it wasn't about them liking me. It was about them respecting me. I wanted them to shift from that resentment to respect. Respect is defined as deep admiration for someone or something elicited by its character. That was important for them to recognize my character because even though outwardly I reminded them of something that they resented, if they knew and understood my character, then they understood that, you know what? He's not what I'm resenting. It's something totally different. First things first, resentment is not always personal. Second, you have to understand why you want them to switch shift. It has to be for that person, not for yourself, and you have to recognize where you want them to go. In my case, it had to be respect, not just liking me. And now we're finally at how. How do you get someone to shift from resentment to respect? The interesting thing about problems and solutions are that the solution to a problem is oftentimes hidden right there within the problem. You see, the problem was resentment. That's bitter indignation as a result of being treated unfairly. The young people thought it was unfair that their older brother was no longer there. They thought it was unfair that my father didn't follow through like he said he would do. They thought it was unfair that he no longer loved me. So how do you fight unfairness? You fight unfairness with consistency. The way that you get someone to shift from resentment to respect is via consistency. But consistency in what? It varies from case to case, but in my case it was consistency in the way that I show love. Consistency in the way that I discipline. But more importantly, above all of that, it was consistency in just being there. I had young people say, Mr. Hole, I, I got a game this week, you coming? Yeah, I'm gonna come to your game. Even though I know you're not getting no playing time, I'm gonna be at the game. Mr. Hole, did you see me at the game? Yeah. I, I saw you down there keeping the bench warm, but it's all good. I, I'm here for you. And hey, Mr. Ho, I, I'm singing a solo Sunday. You coming through? Yeah, I'm going to come through, even though I know singing not your gift. But I'm going to come through and show love. <laughs> consistency is vital. Consistency is so important because consistency breeds security. When a person is secure, when a person feels safe, then they're able to open up and thrive and truly grow. For young people who've never experienced security before, that can be truly life-changing. So first things first, resentment is not always personal. Just because someone shows signs of resentment towards you does not mean they're taking it personally out on you. The reason why you want them to shift has to be for that person, not for you. You have to know exactly where you want them to go. It can't be all about a person liking you. It has to be about respect. And lastly, the way that you get a person to shift from resentment to respect is through consistency. Just a few days ago, 
a buddy of mine has been teaching me how to drive a stick shift. So I've never driven one before, and it's, it's been an interesting experience. Uh, a lot of jerking and jopping, stalling out, it's, it's a whole lot of that. But when we first started, he said, man, one thing, the most important thing for you to learn initially is the biting point of the car, when you have to learn how to release the clutch. So essentially, when it comes to driving a stick shift, you have to know how to work the clutch. He said the clutch forces neutrality. And once you are in neutrality, then you're able to shift from one gear to the next. So if you're trying to go down the road and you're going a certain speed, you have to go to the next gear in order to get up to the speed and continue to go. Likewise, consistency is the clutch that helps people shift from resentment to respect. Consistency is the clutch that helps people shift from where they are to where they need to go. We all have the ability to help the people within our sphere of influence shift from where they are to where they need to go, but the question still remains. Will you come through in the clutch or not? Y'all be good, man.